before I, I ask Jane to introduce Ch Trish, I'd like to welcome you all here today and acknowledge that we are, I am meeting today on the land of the Gadigal people, uh, land whose sovereignty is never ceded. Um, and I'd like to send um, my greetings and blessings on their leaders, um, past, present and emerging, and also to the leaders of the land on which all of you are meeting. Um, very briefly, I'd just like to remind you what the Sophia Holland Lecture is. We hold it each year in memory of Sophia Holland. Sophia is the mother of Marjorie Murray, who is, one, is our chief benefactor whose money is held by the University of Sydney. And it's from that money we pay the office rent and our administrator and lots of other sort of basic administration uh, things. Her mother, Sophia, is a very early graduate of, of Sydney University. She was born in 1871. Um, she, uh, she lived in Fort Street, so presumably she went to Fort Street. I haven't heard, heard when she was educated, but she matriculated in 1890 and began an arts degree at Sydney. Uh, she, felt she completed that and graduated in 94, and her arts degree was in French English and Latin. Uh, with no record of her teaching in the public system, but we think she taught in the Catholic system for seven years before she married her husband, George Henry Holland. Uh, it was his second marriage, so she inherited several children to go with that, but her firstborn herself was, uh, was uh, Marjorie. So, on that note, I would now have remind you of who we are talking about and why we're holding this lecture. I'd ask Jane, please, to introduce uh, Professor Davidson. We're honoured indeed to have Patricia here as our speaker today. Um, she's a woman with many achievements. Uh, looking briefly at Wikipedia, etc., she started as a nurse at Wollongong Hospital. She went to Wollongong University, did a Bachelor of Arts, a Master's of Education, her thesis was living with heart failure, so it did go back to her nursing. She's worked, it seems, at many, many universities, Curtin, University of Western Sydney, UTS. Um, she was in charge of research nursing into cardiac disease at St. Vincent's, which is, after all, our main cardiac hospital, probably in Australia. She has recently been given an honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Nursing. Um, but above all, she is really, as they say, one of the outstanding alumni of the University of Wollongong, the first woman to be vice chancellor there, and the first alumna to be uh, um, there. For her to give us her time this morning to talk to us about women's health, which is one of her feature of research, is an amazing privilege. And I welcome you and I look forward to all you're going to say. Thanks so much, Jane, and um, greetings uh, wonderful women and the men who get it. Um, it's wonderful to see you uh, here, uh, Trevor. And it's also my honor uh, to be able to, to give um, this uh, lecture today. So just let me, I'll just do that sign. Okay. So um, I thought I would use the honour of giving the Sophia Holland lecture um, to really underscore the importance of women's health in global health. And also to really amplify I, what I see, the vision and mission of graduate women and graduate women in New South Wales as seeing education as really a transformative force for good in the world, but also importantly, as a key driver of women's health. And I just would like to take this opportunity to thank Graduate Women New South Wales for all they do to support education of women in the sector. So um, it was great to hear Trisha's introduction and to hear a little bit about Sophia Holland, the mother of Marjorie uh, Murray, and to think back of the time in which she got her education. Um, she matriculated at Sydney University in 1890s, and this is a bit of the fashion of the time. 
Uh, this would have been the area in which she grew up in, or in, in the 1890s, she lived in Terry Lane, just off Forest Street, a very different place uh, to uh, what is today. And, um, you know, these are some of the other focal points that we see um, around uh, the CBD of Sydney. So a very different time. And I think in 1890s, the years in which Sophia Holland matriculated to Sydney University, women had a life expectancy of 50.8 years and men 47.2 years. So because of the power of education, the power of technological innovation, and also the power of making sure that education was more equitably distributed is a major driver of health and well-being. In the days in which Sophia Holland matriculated, a thousand mothers died for every hundred thousand live births. Today, fortunately in Australia, there is only five maternal deaths per 100,000. And then um, of, as the time uh, when um, Sophia would have been at Sydney University, here's Dagmar Byrne, who was the first medical student um, in academic dress at um, Sydney University. And, you know, these were truly uh, the trailblazers of education for women. Um, I think, from the very early days when women were first admitted to Australian universities in the 1880s, um, from these tiny beginnings by uh, 1949, uh, there was 18% of women were undergraduates, nearly 45% by the 1980s, and now over 50% in 2012. And now for people like me, vice chancellors, going into law schools, et cetera, in, in some ways, there are 70, 80% of, of women in some of those courses. So Sophia and her sisters were really, truly trailblazers and have made a difference. But yet, even though women now make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, they hold yet a quarter of the most influential leadership positions. So why is this important? Why is this link between education and health so important? Because, and I'll give some illustrative examples later on, because of uh, so significant advances, in spite of significant advancements, there are still unequal power relationships between men and women, particularly in some cultures. There are some social norms that decrease education and plan in uh, paid employment opportunities. Traditionally in healthcare, there has been a focus on women's reproductive roles, and this is the same in uh, the context of global health. As women live longer, there is much less attention on the chronic conditions that women have. And also the link between economic stability and health in latter years. And in fact, one of the most increasingly disenfranchised groups across the whole world are older women. And because of this, is a failure, has been a failure in many health systems to recognize a life course approach to health and well-being. We know that the postcode in which you're born into will largely predict your health and well-being across the lifespan. And we know in schools, generally what children are at um, by fourth grade is going to be a determinant of their success in life. And then the other thing is that we know that women are much more exposed to physical, sexual and emotional violence. And this has been amplified during COVID times. And I think what has been really absence in the discussion of women's health more broadly is the financial aspects. So women live longer lives, but sadly, much of this life is punctuated by ill health and disability and commonly financial hardships. Um, many women who are widowed do not have, um, you know, suddenly losing an income of a spouse is a drastic um, impact, particularly if you're paying rent 
and you lose uh, that additional pension. So I think if we're thinking about women's health, we need to think about the financial aspects. And we know that many women do not have um, adequate uh, superannuation or adequate savings because of changes and alterations in women's career trajectory. But we do know that in particular where we can address um, reproductive health in many countries, in high, middle and low income countries, women have better health. And we know that this makes good economic sense, that healthier women and their children contribute to more productive and better societies. We know that this financial sustainability, including gross domestic product, or gross national product, um, labor force participation, all of these factors are related to the health, well-being, and education of women. And through as I mentioned previously, providing opportunities for deliberate family planning, healthy mothers um, make healthy children and more educated women mean that children will be likely healthy. And we know, as I mentioned, that the long-term productivity, economic productivity of society is dependent upon women. The other thing, and it was great, I think um, it might have been, uh, one of our colleagues earlier in the chat was talking about gender. And I think particularly in health, in cardiovascular health, um, people will talk a lot about sex-based differences. And I think it's really important to do, distinguish, particularly in, in the health sector, between sex and gender. So sex are the biological attributes, um, including our physiological and genetic makeup, Whereas gender refers to the culturally defined roles, responsibilities, and attributes that are associated between being either a male or female. And we even know that this binary construct of gender is being challenged in many spheres. So I think it's really important that we think about, you know, what is what does gender really mean? You know, and some people use that term as a substitute for sex. Um, some as an identity and some in particular as a social system. And we know that gender is a system that can create social stratification. And there is, we know differences in resources, power, roles, entitlement and behaviours between gender driven roles. And why do we know this? We know that in spite of many of uh, the affirmative action activities that have occurred since the days of when uh, Sophia Holland matriculated to universities. We know now that still there's a pay gap between men and women at 23% globally. We know that women do over twice the amount of unpaid care and domestic work that men do. And if we look at informal caregiving, it's, it's in the 85% predominantly women. We know around the world that women make up only 23% of parliamentarians. And in many countries around the world, and particularly in some countries uh, that are subject to significant human rights atrocities, such as Afghanistan, sons and daughters don't have equal inheritance rights. And as a consequence, I think it's really important that we think about the more vulnerable um, segments of society. We know a lot about our Indigenous sisters and brothers who have disproportionate health aspects. But one of the areas of my research has been on the health and well-being of older women who, as I've mentioned, live a longer life, but not necessarily optimising their quality of life. And significant social determinants of health, particularly financial, can impact women as they age. So as I mentioned, we are delighted to see this increase in life expectancy. And we as women um, can expect to live to a very ripe old age. And in fact, centenarians are the fastest growing segment of the Australian population with one in every three children born today living to be 100. And for much of our efforts in global health and women's health is to make sure that this longevity is um, met with, with 
adequate quality of life, adequate resources, and not decrease suffering and symptom burden. And we know, as we think about an equity agenda, is that across the life cycle, adverse events, recurrent traumatic events can have an impact on health and well-being. Um, Tricia mentioned uh, me starting at Wollongong Hospital. Um, if I said in the 70s in the coronary care unit, uh, depression was a risk factor for heart disease, people would have thought I was crazy. But in fact, we know that depression, anxiety and stress are not only predictors of many adverse health conditions, but can also make them worse. And I think the other thing that is important as we look at health, and I've talked a little bit about gender previously, but also the importance of considering the confluence of these factors um, to moderate healthcare outcomes. So increasingly, we think about intersectionality as all of these uh, social determinants of health intersect to deter determine health outcomes. So I mentioned the social determinants of health, and I think these are increasingly important to recognise. So these are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. These are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live and age, and the wider set of forces that shape society. One of the things that often I think about, particularly as a nurse, is these are powerful factors because we do have the opportunity to moderate some of these factors. And I guess the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that um, people, loneliness, uh, poverty, uh, employment factors have all been important drivers of health and well-being during the pandemic. And so in my work, and I think the work, if you no matter what area of healthcare that you look at, whether it be cardiovascular health or um, mental health or aged care, that often we are looking for these, uh, you know, amazing cures and amazing drugs. But if we look at what determines health and well-being, poverty, access to care, environmental exposure, and racism are drivers of adverse health outcomes. So, you know, what can we do about this? And I think this is an interesting thing to think about, and it might be, you know, part of discussion. Um, people often uh, debate and discuss whether quotas and those sort of factors in terms of women's participation are worthwhile. Um, but, you know, I think what is really important if we look at health is when we look as we move to an equity agenda. So I like this schematic. So this is disparity. And you can clearly see, um, you know, the, the disproportionate ability to look at the baseball game here. This is equality. And often we just, it, particularly in health and education, we kind of one size fits all. But we know that this is not going to lead to equity. So in order to, to improve equity, we need to think about um, strategies that are going to improve the health and well-being of particular groups. And so, you know, one of the groups, you know, it's often at both ends of the age spectrum. We know that the first 2,000 days of life are critically important for children and many children need additional support. But we know, particularly due to the social determinants of health, as women age, there are also additional supports and resources and structures that are needed. As I mentioned previously, non-communicable disease, diseases, which are hypertension, cancer, stroke, heart disease, often achieve much less attention in women. And predominantly, except perhaps for the last 20 years, women's health has just been the focus on reproductive health. And some women scholars would say this results in a very utilitarian um, view of of women in many societies. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a snapshot into a project that I'm involved with. Um, and it's just at the Global Women's Health Index. And it's only in its second year. And it's a collaboration between uh, Gallup polls, you know, which you would be well aware of, who uh, do a lot of 
um, workforce studies, and and um, Hologic, which is uh, a company that provides healthcare. So what the Hologic um, index has done, it's identified five dimensions of healthcare, and they've created a weighted score to really try and drive policy makers um, to think about the health and well-being of women, and in particular, what will drive improved life expectancy. So um, in, in the index, you know, a higher score is, is a better score. And as you can see, um, you know, Australia has fared fairly, very well in this index. It's ranked about 10. But as you can see, there are many parts of the world where this survey is done, where um, women's health is in severe jeopardy. And in fact, in the last survey, Afghanistan and India are perhaps the most vulnerable. So before the pandemic, we faced some real uh, challenges in terms of healthcare. We know across the world, populations are aging. We know that climate change is a real threat. We know that um, there is increasing inequity globally across many populations. And we've been faced with significant geopolitical instability. I love this quote from Arundhai Roy, um, and which speaks to where we're at at this critical juncture in the history of the world. And historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And that's one of the things that I would just like to spend a few minutes talking about. And again, to really emphasize to you the importance of considering social determinants of health. Very often with a very biomedical focus, we just focus solely on drugs and procedures. But as you can see here, this is um, from Circulation Journal uh, in the US, which has identified that socioeconomic factors, access to care, disproportionate burden of comorbidities, discrimination, employment, biological mechanisms have all, and cultural factors, have all contributed to adverse health outcomes. We know at the moment there is 100 million women globally out of the workforce, and those women are between the ages of 25 to 45. And we know across the world, issues such as gender-based violence have increased. And in some countries, particularly um, those where there is high rates of geopolitical instability, there is uh, a huge impact. So as I mentioned, you know, we can't change our parents and it's very hard to change our gene structure, but we can address social determinants of health. So factors such as providing access to housing, adequate food, healthcare um, coverage, education, access to internet, transport, and policy enablers, are all important solutions to addressing the health disparities in the world. And each of these factors, particularly for at-risk populations, women who are subject to gender-based violence, who are poor and have multiple chronic conditions, are very vulnerable. And we know it's hard to believe, but in Australia, there are many women who are homeless. So, now sort of coming back to, I think, what is the power of Graduate Women New South Wales and the power of the work that I know each of you have achieved in your career and that we all strive to do in universities. I love this quote from Nelson Mandela, which says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can do use to change the world. And I think this is something each and us is very committed to. I love the Graduate Women New South Wales focuses on women who have financial challenges or have not had linear um, opportunities. And these opportunities for scholarships are very important. Increasingly, we know uh, that access to education, even though 
compared to the United States and other countries, education is accessible because of hex debts. I know even at the University of Wollongong, petrol prices, the need to work are all factors that influence graduates' outcomes. We know from studies in nursing that if once students work more than 16 hours a week, their grades begin to suffer. And this doesn't matter if they're working in healthcare settings. There is a need to be attentive to, um, to particular studies. And then the other thing that I think is really important as we look around the world, and this sadly is, is a photo from Ukraine, in war-torn countries, women are still victims of sexual violence. They often carry a disproportionate demand for caregiving. And I think we cannot um, ignore the huge impact of these factors around the world. We know from the Holochik survey this year that across the world, the mental health of women has um, decreased as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. So addressing these factors is critically important. I just put this slide here because I think even in our society where we think we have achieved a lot, and we think back from Sophia Holland's first days at Sydney University, I'm sure she found, found very many similar sites. But this is a photo um, in the Trump administration, a photo from the Washington Post in 2017, where there was a discussion about women's health. And conspicuously, <clears throat> pardon me, absent is a woman in this photo. I put this here because even though we as women <clears throat> have been afforded many opportunities, these gains are fragile and we need to hold on to them and to make sure that the generations coming behind us have access to education. <coughs> Pardon me. So I thought I would stop there here to really allow time for discussion and reflection. As I've mentioned, the health and well-being of the world is dependent upon the health and well-being of women. This means not just adequate reproductive health care and protecting women from death and disability from childbirth, but making sure that across a life course and a lifespan, the women have access to adequate health care. And more importantly, that we build a society where women have adequate infrastructure financially to prepare them for a longer life. And we want to make sure that that longer life for women is means engage productivity with society, financial stability, and good health. So again, I just wanted to stop and thank Graduate Women New South Wales for all they've done to support um, scholars in the state of New South Wales. Thank you for the opportunity to honor Sophia Holland in this lecture. I think the world has changed a lot since she started out and matriculated in 1890. But I think we've seen around the world some stark examples where the fight for women's rights is still challenging and that we need to maintain our focus and in particular, make sure that all women and girls have access to an education because we know that will be a pathway, not just to their good health, but the health and well-being of their families. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Trish. And before we thank you formally, uh, yeah, who has a question for Trish, please? Shirley? And thank you very much indeed, um, Professor. I'm, 
I went over to Chogham to the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting to talk about gender. And the day I arrived, they said, we want you to talk about older women. And I think that was to do with my, um, my work with the National Older Women's Network in Australia. But it was the first time that the Commonwealth had dealt with older women in their history. And it was very interesting to see the interest from across the countries about what was happening to older women's health, et cetera. So I'm glad you mentioned that in your, your talk, that um, as, as you look around the group here today, we're probably all in that bracket. Um, Trevor is an older man, um, but we're, we're all in that older age group and we need a lot more work to be done on the needs of older women, health needs, social needs, et cetera. So thank you for that reference. No, I think, Shirley, you, you've made an excellent point. And I think um, we don't have adequate focus on attention. And, and I think for professional women, likely, who have worked, we're protected by our superannuation. But for many women, that, that is not the case. And so uh, the ability to afford healthcare, even in the context of universal healthcare, is, is challenging. And, you know, there are still some factors that are still taboo. So um, I was had the privilege of giving a talk at Harvard uh, Business School to a group of, you know, people in the healthcare stream. And, you know, they all had plans for startups for this and startups for that. And I said to them, uh, look, if you, if you really want to make a lot of money, I would tackle something like continence. And they looked at me like I was a crazy old lady, which, you know, they were all in their 20s. But I think that's true. You know, we have not many of those things we don't talk about, um, you know, how and that's for men and women but we don't really truly address some of the healthcare challenges of of aging and i know from my area of work in cardiovascular disease we know that often commonly that women's symptoms of heart attacks are ignored uh, because they're not seen to be stereotypical and we know that the presentation of heart disease in women is different so Thank you. I knew, Shirley, I could remember you talking about before, and I think that's important to think of, of, of the social determinants of health and what's going to make a difference to older women. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jane? Um, the other end of the spectrum, I wonder if you can tell us something about how universities are coping with these students who are coming back after two years of no face-to-face -face teaching, and if there are any special... Uh, moves you're making to help their psychological approach coming back into um, a, a proper university again. No, I think Jane, you've made an excellent point. And what we're finding is that the students want flexibility. And there was a study done of where students were actually accessing online and some of them were actually sitting outside the lecture hall. Um, so accessing the lecture online on their computers. So I think, Jane, what it's forcing us in universities to make face-to-face -face contact, contact thoughtful and intentional, you know, incentivizing students to come. But then the other real issue, Jane, is the mental health of students. The, youth, the, the level of mental health conditions is really challenging in young people and also, youth suicide is something that I worry a lot about. So I think um, we just have to really encourage students to come in and to be flexible. Um, because some students have been very happy just online um, and other people just want the social contact. So I think we, we really need to be flexible, but to make sure it's worth coming to university for. Uh, have you actually got any um, in, increased psychological help? I mean, the schools have taken yes. on. Yes, yes, we do. And in fact, you know, we have, uh, like, as probably many universities, we have a, 
you know, as well as our mental health issues, we have 24 hour lifeline services, but it is a real issue and concern. And sadly, we've had several deaths by suicide as many other universities have. So how we help people, younger people to, um, to, I guess, move beyond the doom and gloom of they perceive. And, and in fact, um, I was talking to an author the other day, John Green, and he was saying, I was telling him about this issue and he's um, publishing a book now, which is actually trying to tell young people about the good things that happen in the world. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that. That's why we think of Sophia Holland. Uh, she, you know, the average age life expectancy was 50 years. Now, for most of us, it's 88 years. So that's a good thing. Um, if we have vaccines, look, being a working in healthcare, if someone told me in 2020, March 2020, um, when people said, we would have a vaccine by the end of the year. I thought you're dreaming and we did have it. So I think um, it's how we get balance those messages and that's the role of the media, um, et cetera. But we really have to do a lot of outreach to our younger students. Thanks. Anyone else there? Okay, Trish, uh, one thing I don't know if Jane told you before I came online, but we're very proud of one of your students who is a, a, a recipient of our, our major disadvantaged award is Sarah Clark in social work. Oh. She happened to be with us today, but she has a medical appointment that she couldn't change. So she oh, great. Well, well, thank you for, thank you for, um, for uh, looking out for her and for us and for sponsoring. I mean, I think one of the great things about the University of Wollongong is probably 50% of our students are first in family. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. And we, we know it makes a difference. Even at, we have campuses at um, Bega, Batemans Bay and Shoalhaven. And if you looked at the spreadsheet, you would think not, doesn't make sense, but you go to those graduations and you see the person who gave the graduation address, she was a young woman who had a baby at 18 and she went back and, and did nursing. So in those schools, nursing and teaching, and importantly, those people are staying in that area. Um, I've just got a question from Sienna. Um, okay. So I think um, the invisibility of women's health and um, how we could uh, address things differently. I think the importance is um, uh, getting more women into medicine. Um, we know they're coming, they come in at, um, to do their you know, general education, but very few, it's just like that, uh, the elevator stops and they don't progress to specialties. Um, and I think um, one of the things that we are doing in New South Wales is, um, is we are developing a um, women in academia as part of the New South Wales Vice Chancellors Group. So I think that there is a lot we could we can do. Um, you go into the to I have this um, kind of thing that often I do. And I, I went to Cafe Sydney the other day with a donor, not my usual haunt, um, but I love going in and just seeing, and I take a photo. And can I tell you in Cafe Sydney for lunch, it's still 85% men and 15% women. I've also, if you look down business class, you're on the plane in economy and you look down to business class, it'll still be 85% men, 15% women. So I think we've still got a way to go to, to get women into, into um, you know, to positions where they have the checkbook and they can change the destiny. I think that's really important. And I think the other thing is, is in um, universities, we have to think more about 
the usual rather than the weird and the wonderful. Um, I could say, you know, I'd say if you go to Grand Rounds when I worked at Johns Hopkins or even the same when I was at St Vincent's, in Grand Rounds, they always talk about the weird and the, the wonderful. Uh, the thing that I always remember is, you know, the, the, the young person who, who ate, a, you know, one of those slugs on a lettuce and it ended up getting into his brain. They're the things that often Grand Rounds are about. But, you know, Grand Rounds are... Um, not very often say around shortness of breath, which we know is a common symptom in older women and a common source of disability. So I think part of it is pivoting to looking at symptom management, looking at healthy aging, and rather than you know looking for this magic bullet. And of course, this is because many of the drivers in the healthcare system are around you know, the pointy end, not necessarily um, the lives that most um, people leave. And we have to talk about some of the things, like let's talk about menopause. Um, you know, I had an early menopause in my 40s and I actually left my job because I thought I was going crazy, but no one ever talks about it. No one ever talks about, you know, those challenges because... Again, it's kind of secret women's business and sometimes we feel ashamed because we're not coping. It's the same as postnatal depression. It's, you know, so part of it is how we have the discussion and the debate about issues that are common amongst many women. Mel. Well. Patricia, I have um, a challenge because I, in my another hat, I'm a secretary of polio in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, as someone hit in a minuscule epidemic at the age of 15 months, um, the concept of epidemics has a different impact on me from a lot of other people. Um, so, no, there's some funny thoughts gone through my head since COVID. But we have the problem that because it's 60 years since the last epidemic in Australia, nearly all our members are older. Um, and probably seven, 60, 70 percent of them are women. So we have the challenge of trying to provide support to older women um, who have many of whom have had a disability for, or in my case, for 76 years, um, some for longer. So you, how, it's a challenge to try and supply, supply support to people in those circumstances. And our biggest challenge now is that, you know, the main way of support has to be digital, and how do you get those who are not computer literate or are, um, say, Zoom shy to learn about what, you know, the kind of things you're saying about improving their mental health, um, health in old age. You now, it, it's a real challenge. Yeah. And look, I don't know about... You, but often I think, you know, how do you survive if you're not computer literate these days? I mean, like, it's a challenge for all of us with resources, etc. So um, one of the things that people are actually talking about as a social determinant of health is digital literacy. Um, so I think, again, polio is something that's invisible. Um, people don't realise that, you know, that there's late effects, as you know, that so some people that may have had functional recovery may have secondary effects. Um, but, but as you're talking, you know, I'm thinking about can you, can you partner with other organisations? And then the other thing is that what a lot of health schools have is what is service learning. You know, um, how do you get students, medical, nursing, social work, 
students going to people's homes. I just think they're some of the things that we have to think about. Um, but again, uh, we think about healthcare is about the hospital, not about where the community. Um, so, well, I'll give it give it some thought, and I, I can maybe connect through Christine if I have have some thoughts. Where are you based, Merle? I live in Lithgow, and but our committee, our board members, are spread from. Um, Alstonville to the south coast and out to Mudgee. And that's the board members, let alone the members. Yeah, yeah. So we do, the only one, we have one down Jarvis Bayway. He's the only one in anywhere in your direction. Yeah. So, you know, often that, that's an example where there's cumulative effects. You know, if women... If they haven't, if they, you know, if if they haven't been able to work and they've not married or they've divorced, you know, they have very little resources at the end of life. And for many people, polio was a disability where people there was a lot of there's still a lot of stigma about disability. But we are known as the most pig-headed, bloody-minded, stubbornly independent mob on earth. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a definition of a polio survivor. Yeah, uh, no, it's um, yeah, overcoming a lot of adversity. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. If I could cross. Oh, sorry, Doreen. I'm sure I, I was just a bit blown away, um, Professor, by your photo of the the meeting of the health boffins in the, uh, the, as published in the Washington Post. Not one woman there, all of them, none of them looked very young. Um, so they would be coming from a very conservative background, I would have thought. It's when will they ever accept that women know what they need? When do you think that lovely day will ever come? That they will include women in the discussion? Well, you know, I think, I think that's, you know, we have to keep on it. Um, I think we have to keep on it. And a, and a picture tells a thousand words. Um, and, and I think that's why in, in uh, the United States where they've, they've overturned Roe v. Wade, um, and regardless of, you know, I know people have different views, um, on abortion, but it's it's about access to healthcare, and it, as we know, it will happen. It will happen, um, whether it's legal or not. Um, yes. But it's just more likely that that women will die. Mm. But I really think it's about also getting women in into power. Even you know there was even in the the Commonwealth. Um, you were probably there, Tricia, one of those Commonwealth meetings, and you know all the heads of state were all men. Um, and, and so I think we've just got to be, just keep, keep working. And then sometimes you wonder about affirmative action. So, you know, if you look at, and my comments are apol uh, apolitical, but you look at the Labor Party that have had quotas versus the Liberal Party without quotas. So sometimes I don't know. And then, in my profession, such as nursing, um, you know, in spite of nursing being a great career and well paid, etc., in most countries throughout the world, there's only 10% of men are nurses. So, you know, we've been doing a lot of work to say, well, look, um, particularly as jobs go, you know, but that's because caregiving is very feminized, etc. So, um, yeah, but I think, Doreen, we just here have to keep at it and keep having the conversation. And, you know, that's why Graduate Women New South Wales is very powerful because, you know, just believing in people, giving them agency and um, that support is really important. And, you know, I remember, you know, that very impressive luncheon with the Governor General there, just having that level of sponsorship and support. I just think think is important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Christine. Yes, 
Oh, yes, I am unmuted. Um, Patricia, thank you very much for your, it's thought provoking. Also a reminder that although we think we've come a long way when we do comparisons with what was the case perhaps a hundred years ago, we still have, <coughs> excuse me, have a very long way to go. And the other reminder, which is kind of, in a way it sort of sets you back a bit, that we, we're living so much longer, but yeah, there are so many more challenges. And that as always, uh, women, the issues in relation to women are left often to women to, to pursue. Um, and that is the ongoing challenge for all of us. So thank you very much for the uh, Sophia Holland lecture. And thank you for making us think again about what we need to do. Well, my pleasure. It's, it's really been an honour. It's been great to, to get to know many of you. And um, the University of Wollongong is, is very happy to support initiatives. Yeah. Well, virtual, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been a truly an honour to, to learn about um, Sophia. And just to remind myself, you know, that even though, you know, we've achieved um, maybe 45 years of life experience, or, or at least, no, 35 years of life ex expectancy since her time, uh, we want to make sure that that life is lived healthy and well, not homeless, sleeping in a car, mm. um, where, which we know is increasing. Thank, thank you to members and friends and, and Trish, and just to remind members and anyone else who's interested. Our next time we'll be getting together, hopefully, is for our Jean Arnott lunch, where we celebrate the contribution to society of women over 90. And wow. we have at, at that meeting, three of our members will be celebrated. Mm -hmm. And that uh, just, you, you've had the notice about that and hopefully we can get a good good table or two together to celebrate again with the, with the governor at Parliament House for women over 90. Thank you very much. Goodbye.